So tonight we have a very special presentation for you, and I'm going to give the mic over to uh, someone who's going to moderate a lovely Q&A. Her name is Kimmy Martinez, who has a BA in theater performance from the University of Portland, and she's got an MFA, which is not easy to get, in poetry and in screenwriting. She's also adapted several of her poems into both screenplays and to films. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kimmy Martinez. Film Festival. You guys are the late nights that enjoy every bit of a Cinequest here, and thank you for being here. Um, tonight, I would like to um, introduce a poet and a critic that I truly admire. He re recently finished a tour of the 58 counties in California, not only sharing his own poetical uh, talents, but inspiring poetry out of our diverse communities in California. Uh, this former chairman of the National Endowment for Arts, of the Arts, has a long history of supporting and creating programs for the arts, artists, art educators, and those in un underserved communities. I would like to welcome, and help me welcome him please, uh, our California Poet Laureate, Dana Joya. Dana Joya, it's an honor to give this uh, award to you um, on behalf of CineQuest. This is the uh, Visionary Award, and uh, here you go. <laughs> it's pretty heavy. <laughs> Questions for you. <laughs> How are you doing tonight? Well, you've kept me busy today. I did, yes. <laughs> we just got back from KKUP, uh, which is a, a, a radio uh, station uh, with um, Out of Our Minds with um, uh, Rochelle Escamilla, and you did a great interview with her on the radio. And we had a, an hour to get a conversation about poetry, music, and life. We did, we did. It was a great conversation. So, um, I would like to start with your phenomenal impact on the arts as a former chairman of the NEA. Um, I'm going to quote this from Business Week magazine. The man who saved the NEA. <laughs> um, the series you founded, NEA National Initiatives, enabled previously undes undeserved um, underserved, sorry, <laughs> underserved communities to get direct grants. Um, some of the programs created were Shakespeare in American Communities, Operation Homecoming, Writing uh, the Wartime Experience, Poetry Out Loud, uh, Reading at Risk, is that correct too? Reading at Risk, and uh, NEA Jazz Masters, and so many more. Um, do you recall a moment from one of these events where you witnessed the direct impact from, from the grants you created? Actually, I can recall dozens of moments. Uh, it, when I came in to uh, lead the National Endowment for the Arts, it was in serious jeopardy of being uh, exterminated. Mm -hmm. uh, it had been voted out of existence by the House of Representatives. Uh, it was on a reduced budget. They had fired half the staff. And what I was trying to do was to rebuild the agency in a way that we could have widespread support, not just among artists, but among uh, ordinary citizens and among basically political leaders. And so uh, to everybody's surprise, rather than playing it safe and sort of hiding, uh, trying to do non-controversial things, we launched one after the other the biggest programs in our history. Uh, we didn't even have funding for them, but I felt that if the idea was good enough, the funding would come. And one of the most interesting ones, it was the first thing that we did, was to launch a program called Shakespeare in American Communities. And, and what we did is we uh, tried to bring theater to communities that didn't have live theater. So we found uh, eight companies, and we 
had them tour all 50 states. We would come into small towns, into a theater. We would fill half the seats for free with high school students and their teachers and chaperones, and then fill the rest with the community. And uh, this, uh, we gave eventually 75 theater companies in it, thousands of actors, uh, hun you know, hundreds and hundreds of paid performances. Yeah. But I remember one night we were in uh, a kind of sketchy neighborhood in Philadelphia. Okay. And uh, since I was going to be there and they were going to use it as a fundraiser, a lot of very wealthy people came. So we had about four rows of extremely wealthy people. I was sitting between Kevin Klein um, and Angela Lansbury. Yeah. And so they were there and then they were all talking and doing what fund, you know, if people to give big checks to, and then suddenly into the theater came hundreds of inner city students who had never obviously been to a theater before. And the two groups sort of looked at each other, and I realized this is, these are two groups that don't mix in America. And they came in there, and the kids were having a great time. You know, the show hadn't started, but they were making so much noise that the actors began peeking from the stage to see what was going on. <laughs> Uh, and they came out, uh, and within f three or four minutes, the kids were completely wrapped up in this fantastic performance of o Othello that we were doing. Mm -hmm. By the intermission, both yeah. groups were talking, and it reminded me really of what theater, what arts do. First of all, it takes people and sort of awakens them to see things that they hadn't normally experienced. Mm -hmm. But also it brings people together yeah. who might not normally be together right. and it gives them something in common. And so I think it's fundamental for the, both the development of individuals and the development of communities. And I saw this in one way or another across all the arts. It really, you know, perhaps a hundred times, of, you know, these various yeah. things. And, and I think that's why the country needs a federal arts agency. Yes, excellent. Great, thank you. So talking about uh, diversity, um, you toured uh, 58 or 58 counties in California. Uh, you just finished that uh, pretty recently. <laughs> yeah, good job. <laughs> a lot of driving. Um, you participated in about 114 events. Um, tell us what you discovered. I mean, is there a continuous California story line um, in the poetry you uh, you heard? from these diverse communities? You have to, first of all, consider California. California is legally one state, but it's really at least five different countries. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you've got the kind of urban Southland, you know, that's along the coast of California from San Diego up through Santa Barbara. You know, you've got 20 million people who live there. You've got the Central Valley, which is the greatest agricultural region in the world. You've got uh, Northern California, which, you know, the sort of the urbanized part, you've got this great uh, sort of northern rainforest of sequoias, and then you have this tremendous mountain range, and you have these deserts to the south, and every one of them has a different culture, different population. The biggest county is, is Los Angeles, 10 million people. Mm -hmm. The smallest county is Alpine, which has 1,400 people. <laughs> so when you go to these counties, you get very different things. But what I found is that no matter where I went, two things were true. Even if it was a big city, a tiny rural community, there was an audience for poetry. People like to hear, you know, poetry read and poetry performed. And the other thing is no matter where you go into California, you can stand in the middle of the desert, uh, you'll meet another artist. Uh, there's writers, painters, filmmakers, musicians. And everywhere I went, uh, I did not appear by myself. I invited people from the community. So we could have maybe a dozen uh, writers and musicians on the stage. And it was an opportunity really to bring the community together to recognize how much talent they had. Because a lot of the towns I went to had never had a poetry reading before. Mm, yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. And it was, it was an education. Um, yeah. It was tough on my car. I went through <laughs> three sets of tires. <laughs> Did you have to change it yourself? <laughs> what 
pull him to the side. <laughs> Thank God, no. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so let's go. Hey, so uh, J Dana Joya is going to be here tomorrow for Poets and Film Night um, at the Hammer Theater at 7:15, and he's our guest uh, poet. Um, so this, uh, and during that time, we have eight different um, poet performers and a live band called Rebels Camp. It's a local um, band, a great band, and uh, we also have three poetry films that will be showing. And uh, one is uh, Mike Joya, which is your son. Uh, so I've been told. Yes. <laughs> um, who uh, ha has a company, Blank Verse Films, um, a wonderful poem, Opposites Games, that will be showing. Um, can we talk about poetry and poetry films? And I think it's a very interesting topic, and it's very much a topic of the moment. Yeah, um, you were speaking earlier about it, um, the um, poetry on the page, then poetry to the stage, and then what it is to write poetry for film, um, to have it visualized. Can you, can you talk about that? Well, let me put it in a broader context just for a moment. Most of you probably, you know, you see a poet on a stage and don't you feel a little sorry for me? You know, I mean, you know, you know poet is, you know, seems to be a forgotten, antiquated thing. But the fact is, poetry is the fastest growing art in the United States. Um, the audience has increased 76% in the last five years, and actually among younger people, it's doubled. And so, for a variety of reasons, poetry is something that really appeals to people right now. And one of the main things that's happened in poetry is it's gone from something you read on the page to something that you see performed. And so I think film has become really a natural medium for poetry. Uh, both people watching films and students, young people making their own films. You know, it's replaced the printed page. Yeah, um, yeah I certainly see that. Um, I don't know if you know uh, motion, uh, motion poems. Um, they're, yeah, they're great. Um, and they've been doing, a, a, taking famous, they're uniting um, filmmakers with um, poetry, po uh, famous poems, and making some phenomenal poetry films. <laughs> and, and the d democratization of technology, which allows the average person basically to be able to do you know, a modestly sophisticated film by themselves, right. has made this really a very uh, inclusive and widespread art. Yeah, it's great. Well, Dana, I, I've got the signal that uh, <laughs> We're finished here. Is there a, just a poem that uh, you would like to recite? Um, if I have time, I'll do one short poem. Yes. I wrote a, an opera, the words for an opera, based on the silent film Nosferatu, also remade by, you know, by Werner Herzog, and then there was even a film about it. And this is the vampire's love song from Nosferatu. And so he's courting a woman and has to convince her why she should love him. I am the image that darkens your glass, the shadow that falls wherever you pass. I am the dream you cannot forget, the face you remember without having met. I am the truth that must not be spoken, the midnight vow that cannot be broken. I am the bell that tolls out the hours. I am the fire which warms and devours. I am the hunger that pierces your side, the ache of desire you feel inside. I am the sin you have never confessed, the forbidden hand caressing your breast. You've heard me inside you, speak in your dreams, sigh in the ocean, whisper in streams. I am the future you crave and you fear. You know what I bring. Now, I am here. Thank you.